so welcome back to the Stafford Beer Brain of the Firm Reading Group with General Intellect Unit. Uh, we have made it, folks. We are on Chapter 20, the prospectus, uh, the long-awaited prospectus. Uh, so now uh, we are going to just look briefly at Beer's intro to this chapter because he does actually have something to say. Uh, in the beginning of this section, which is such a long section. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. Uh, so he says, um, the final chapter proffers a prospectus for the future of applications in managerial cybernetics. It does not contain any prescriptions simply because it does not make any predictions. Instead, Chapter 20 prepares two models which, it argues, are basic to the innovatory management of any such future. Firstly, it ought to be expected that the impetus to radical change derives from a critical situation. If so, it is necessary to comprehend the nature of crisis itself in the kind of society by which the last part of the 20th century is characterized. Secondly, and because of these very societary trends, it is of the utmost importance to determine what the progress to which all aspire actually means. The model put forward for this is based on the Aristotelian concept of entelechy rather than, for instance, per capita income or life expectancy. Thus, the book ends with consideration for the perilous future of a planet already torn by almost unimaginable dissensions and cruelties, which are perhaps more a function of gross mismanagement than of brutish greed. Surely the destruction of the Chilean democracy on which this part is based is an example of the working out of counterproductive policies by which may be well-intentioned superpowers conspicuously mishandle their power and snuff out the viable system. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't think anything I've read about uh, presidential history suggests there's well-intentioned activities going on there, but uh, who knows? Uh, let's find out. Um, all right. Uh, chapter 20 is the prospectus. Having undergone the experience recounted in the preceding four chapters and drawing a veil over subsequent events, involving as they did much agony for so many, I want to turn, if that is possible, to positive conclusions. It is only by consolidating what has been learned within some framework that a prospectus for future work can be formulated. The problem for a long time was to know what the framework is to which so many impressions and facts, lacunae, inferences, and convictions are supposed to relate. Each of us who were colleagues in this affair seems to place the emphasis on what we learn differently, and this is probably because we are all using different reference frames, and even those change at different times. This was a third world issue. This was a new kind of Marxism. This was a cheap technology undertaking of high science. This was a managerial revolution. Yes, and it was many other things too. The cybernetics of the viable system relates to them all, and none seems to be central to such an undertaking at, or sorry, and none seems to be central to such an undertaking as we made and which could be made again somewhere else. Where else? I went to various countries by invitation to discuss the use of managerial cybernetics in government at a high level. Their circumstances were all different. So were the circumstances of the firms who called me in different. It gradually came home to me that what they all had in common was a recognition that things were not working well. The... Uh, I believe this is that, this is supposed to be that, there's a typo here, that all familiar remedies had been tried and had failed, and that a radically fresh approach had to be attempted. Now things are not working well anywhere, or in any institution, but that fact is not always recognized, 
And if it is, many managers and ministers truly believe that more stringent applications of ineffectual remedies will somehow work in the end. Then in terms of management science, what was dividing the world in two was the perception of impending crisis. This was the common condition of my involvement, and it was also enough to set radical reappraisals in motion everywhere. What counts as a crisis is the expectation of a loss of control. In other words, cybernetic breakdown in the institution. This does not refer to an inability to impose decisions. Excuse me, had to sneeze there. <laughs> it means that the institution is out of control itself. We may certainly recall how operational research conceived as the use of transdisciplinary science in tackling ill-formed problems with no known solution, grew and flourished in Britain during the Second World War. This was an extremely radical attack on issues which generals, poring over their between-war sand tables, had imagined they could control, an expectation that was rapidly falsified by land, sea, and air once hostilities began. At that point, crisis was recognized. Radical reappraisals could be made, and, much more importantly, the suggested new solutions would actually be tried, and they usually worked. In today's Britain, crisis has been institutionalized, and so has operational research. Reappraisals are made by tired people who can be relied upon not to propose new ideas. In short, matters are very serious indeed. Returning then to the theme, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> returning then to the theme of perceived crisis as the expectation of cybernetic breakdown, it is obvious to me that the first and foremost lesson of the Chilean work was act fast. We did that, after all, and were able to do so because the threats were imminent and seen to be so. Having understood this lesson, I made speed the essence of my proposals in four other countries, but in each case, the impending crisis exploded before work could begin. So far as it goes, this seems to validate both the hypothesis about crisis and the strategy of swift action. The countries are not named because I do not want to be sidetracked into case histories and because progress may yet be made. The speed with which this advocacy suggests that managerial cybernetics should be undertaken is abhorrent to the scientist and the bureaucrat alike. No one is likely to be awarded a PhD for cutting corners and taking decisions on inadequate evidence. But, as I have argued with passion before, and shall again, if a major part of the manager's problem is to reach a decision by Thursday, that is a parameter of his situation with which the management scientist must deal. Otherwise, he is no good. It will probably cost him his respectability because of the way that the scientific establishment works. But in fact, he is doing nothing more appropriate, excuse me, appropriate than to say, the probability that my advice is correct is lower than I would like, but as high as can be generated by the evidence that could be collected and analyzed in so short a time. But it is this very limitation that makes it essential for the scientist to have as large an armory of weapons as he can amass in advance. This is why fundamental research is published, and why experience counts, in every field of application. The speed with which a surgeon acts in crisis comes to mind. As to the bureaucrat, he is greatly threatened by any reappraisal at all, by radical reappraisal especially, and by swift action most of all. Bureaucratic systems, by their very nature, cannot promote swift action. This is the major strength of their autopoiesis, their self-production, because delaying tactics dissipate the energy of reform. By the same token, however, they cannot move fast enough to arrest swift action if it is sufficiently determined. Fast action works in the crisis mode, and nothing else will. But fast action is very hard to affect. 
insofar as I can now understand the mistakes made in the Chilean work, they seem to be related to the framework of crisis itself. We all knew the major features of the crisis that Chile confronted and tried to take them into account, but these features were presented ad hoc. This was happening, that was a risk, the other was peculiar to the place and time, for sure. For all these reasons, I have tried to create a framework for the application of radical managerial cybernetics that would be based on fathoming the underlying mechanisms of crisis. This framework will now be presented, and if the following subheading and the many pages devoted to its elucidation appear to be a lugubrious start to a prospectus, then it is time to take a realistic look at the world we now inhabit. Um, yeah, I mean, this is very interesting. Uh, I, I think uh, the most interesting thing to me is this point about bureaucracy, which is that bureaucracy is excellent at uh, reproducing itself by stymieing action uh, in with delaying tactics, but at the same time, it's quite uh, poor at adapting to rapidly changing circumstances. Uh, and what that suggests to me, at least, is that the sort of march through the institutions, the uh, Gramscian strategy of the war of position is fundamentally misguided and utterly useless. Now, why is that? It's because the march through the institutions was to go into the institutions and try to change them by bringing in radicals and, and, and changing the system. But by making it a march through the institution and engaging in a war of position, you're fighting exactly the battle that the bureaucracy wants you to fight. Right? You want to actually fight a war of maneuver against the bureaucracy, not a war of position. Uh, but there were so many decades of left thinking and uh, effort put into exactly fighting the war of position, slowly trying to take institutions one by one and change them towards left ends. And unsurprisingly, according to Beer's analysis, it was a failure. Uh, we did get a lot of radical theory being taught to students in universities, but uh, I don't really know what we got aside from that. Uh, okay, so uh, Shane, uh, let's go to you first, then uh, we'll go to Jake and then Jeremy. Yeah, I, d I definitely agree with your analysis there, especially of the, um, the sort of, yeah, good trying to go into the institutions because it's, it's like fighting a slug on its own terms. Like, you no, know, just go faster than it does. So you, you can do that easily, right? But there's something very pernicious about that, that, like, we chose as our own strategy to engage the enemy on their own turf, on their own terms, and in a way that actually fulfilled their desires. Because what the, what the bureaucracy and the establishment are going to always try to do is to reduce your variety to the, st the level that they can deal with. It's slow digestion. And if you slow down deliberately, you're going to get digested a lot more easily. I love the emphasis on speed here. That you, you, and this is Ashby's law, right? That like in, in a conflict between two systems, the, the system that has the greater variety of actions and responses available to itself in, in greater, in like smaller time slices will tend to win. And the one that doesn't have those, those uh, responses available will tend to lose. And speed is a real factor there. Um, I also love uh, the, the, uh, the last paragraph on 350. He's, he's talking about like the surgeon and stuff like this. Like, like the surgeon can react with great velocity to an emergent, like literally emergency scenario, because they're well practiced at speed. They're they're not well they're not they're not like well practiced at doing things slowly. They are very well practiced at doing things at the limit of human speed. So I think this kind of indicates what we kind of need to do. We need to be well. This this is like the prefigurative politics here, right? Look, we, 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 it's not so much building up 
bureaucracies building up institutions to, to imitate what capitalist institutions and bourgeois institutions do. We have to instead build institutions that are well-practiced at velocity and at speed and at absolutely overwhelming, I was going to say force, but it's not quite force, it's, it's velocity. It's, it's agility that you have in that sense. You know? um, and this, it, it, this, whole, this whole section kind of reminds me of a sort of thing about like, like in, in Deleuze and Guattari's like uh, Thousand Plateaus, their, their, their talk about speed is often mistaken for like, and especially in the accelerationist reading of them, this like just, just valorization of speed in itself. But apparently, like from, I, I'm taking this on the authority of fairly clever readers of these folks, apparently what they really mean by speed there is agility. The speed of thought is not just like going off in a straight line. Speed of thought is micro-adaptation. And like, it, it's like the OODA loop. It's like being able to turn your fighter jet on a very tight time scale and very rapidly. So it, it's, it's acceleration of agility that, that, they're, that they're wanting us to take away from that, not just like linear acceleration, um, like a bullet would accelerate. Because bullets aren't very agile, right? The, the thing that's agile is the heat-seeking missile, right? That's, that's your, your, your Norbert Wiener, right? The, 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 guide, the self-guiding missile is more agile and more speedy in that sense than, than a bullet is. I think that's, that's the model we really need to match onto there. We need to get well-practiced at that kind of hyper-agility and, and velocity. And, you know, what beer, do what beer is calling for, completely fucking overwhelm the institutions. Smash them to bits, you know? And, like, this, this also puts the, like, I think a lot of the Kautsky and stuff in the ground as well. That, like, trying, trying, to, trying to take over the state means that you will be digested by the state because you'll be moving slow enough for it to react in time. And it'll be a step ahead of you because if you're, especially if you're deliberately moving slow enough to allow it to always be a step ahead of you, you'll get rehabilitated. You'll get fucking reabsorbed. Um, you got to go fast, go so fast. They can't keep up. Uh, yeah. I mean, that sort of makes me think about, um, you know, it might be valuable to articulate why the strategy of digestion is not effective against the state, right? Because the state is able to digest mm -hmm. radical initiatives quite well. Uh, why aren't we able to digest the state? Because uh, it has the stomach, you know. Yeah. If there's a better way of saying that, right? There's certain yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, that it, it kind of makes me think about, like, why... Uh, Hart and Negri's uh, theories of the multitude are ludicrous, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and basically it comes down to the fact that the multitude doesn't actually have a digestive function. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, no, totally. you know, that's, that's kind of like the metaphor they're using in terms of mm -hmm. saying, like, well, this is why we're already in communism, actually, if we could just wake mm -hmm. up to it, uh, it, is because, like, yeah, the multitude could just digest all, it could just digest empire, and then, mm -hmm. you know, we're in communism. Uh, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, okay, uh, let's go to uh, Jake and then Jeremy. And then uh, we'll yeah. go to Boast. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, definitely agree with everything that has been said so far. I think, you know, it's, it's the point about, like, bureaucracy slowing things down as a way to deal with, like, the variety is, is pretty, like, it's definitely, like, very insightful. And, you know, I think anyone who's tried to experience, like, you know, experience trying to work within these large established systems has like encountered that, like, uh, you know, forming committees to investigate the problem that don't lead anywhere or, you know, all that, that stuff, um, is just like pretty, it makes it pretty clear to me that the answer is to not try to work within the institutions, at least not, you know, as a primary like tactic. I mean, it can be like a step along the way, you know, if, if, if your path intersects with something that they're willing to allow for, you know, it's like, but but it has to kind of be within the existing like potentiality of of outcomes for the bureaucracy, and and, it, and it's and I would say since like the kind of neoliberal turn, the, those like potentialities have just been sh slowly like shut down one by one. You know, so to the point where now we're at, it's just the response. You know, at least speaking from a U.S. context, the answer is just like more police and less services. You know, it's not like you know where you could say 
you could understand maybe why people would think that you could work within the existing system if you're thinking about it from like the perspective of someone who is, you know, kind of coming of age around the time that social democracies were actually like starting and were doing things because, you know, the, the potential outcomes there for the, the even this bureaucracy of the state was like, you know, good thing, like things that are objectively good. Like it's good that there's like, you know, more services and it's good that people get more money from the state or whatever, but it's just like, it's been shut down. So clearly the answer is not to try and grab onto those last existing, like, you know, hopes that, oh, well now it'll just like, we'll just be able to get back to that. It's like, no, the, those doors have closed and those sort of, those p pathways have been so like, you know, ossified and so like got all these bureaucracy like glommed onto them that there's all these inroads that they can use that the bureaucracy can use to like divert energy and divert attention and divert like possibility so it's like you know something new must come and I, I think I think definitely the point about like speed like we have to operate at speed is more it's definitely like a good point and I think people are afraid of it because of the like they're used to things moving slowly they're used to like things not really changing except like the slow decline towards shittiness um and you know i think it's also why the people in power are always surprised every time there's a recession or every time there's like a crash it's like what you're saying things can change quickly sometimes wow i mean no one could have predicted this but it's like yeah things things happen quickly sometimes it's just like any absence of an organized proletariat movement those things never happen in the benefit like never happen to the benefit of us you know um so i think yeah yeah I, I agree with with that like you can't we can't reuse the previous strategies you know i think we have to we have to come up with new ones and i think i think part of that is creating the institutions that like can come up with those new strategies you know um and that means trying out potential new strategies and failing probably but sometimes succeeding and that's the you know that's the that's the thing i think it's just like we need to cultivate more of an ex more of an expectation and like uh an expectation of experimentation and like fighting against that like development of internalized bureaucracy that like shuts down that thing because of fear of not having the control which is like you know i, th I think part of um part of some of the things that I've gotten from this book and from cybernetics and beer generally is like, you know, if, if, if you can create a sort of VSM style organization that is able to adapt to things quickly, then you don't have to fear quick changes and quick things happening as, as though it'll destabilize the system because your system is set up to handle potential quick changes in a way that doesn't just like blow up the existing, like, you know, rickety, like giant scaffolding of bureaucracy and bullshit. It's just like, we just need, you know, we need a slide that just goes down. That's like very quick, you know, it can't just have this, like all these stairs that like go in all these different directions. I'm, I'm mixing metaphors and stuff, but, but yeah, I'll stop now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think that's, uh, that's true. Like, uh, we, yeah, we 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 sh we shouldn't uh, get lost in the labyrinth uh, is maybe the thing because that's you know I mean it's an it's an old metaphor but bureaucracy is labyrinthine. Um, uh, Jeremy, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, to me this is pure John Boyd stuff. Like um, I have a quote here from John Boyd that's totally pertinent to this chapter. He says. In order to win, we should operate at a faster tempo or rhythm than our adversaries. Better yet, get inside the adversary's own OODA loop. So figure out what their loop is, get inside of it. Such activity will make us appear ambiguous, unpredictable, thereby generate confusion and disorder among our adversaries, since our adversaries will be unable to generate mental images or pictures that agree with the menacing, as well as faster transient rhythm or patterns that they are competing against. You know, this idea, Ken Kesey had this idea with the Merry Pranksters, we've got to put them in our movie before they can put us in their movie their movie sucks you know our movie at least has a chance to be better you know and so i like the idea of a strategy that renders you unfathomable to your enemies you know it's what the Viet Cong did in the tet offensive 
it was unimaginable that the Viet Cong would be able to shoot missiles into the U.S. embassy in Saigon. That was just unimaginable to Americans. And they did it. They lost 70% of their forces in the Tet Offensive. They were hurt so badly, it really messed up their ability to continue. But they did continue because what they did was so astonishing that the Americans had no, could not handle it, ended up retreating to just bombing them from the air because after that, it was just too confusing to fight the Viet Cong on the ground. They didn't know what they were doing. So... This idea, I think, is just incredibly powerful of become unfathomable through rapidity. You know, the being in the USA in 2020 is utterly depressing, but a big part of what's depressing is you have insurrections in major cities, and the response of Democrats is, wait till the election. And then the election happens, and the response is, we've got a runoff election in Georgia. Wait till then. And it's like you're they're always going to try and slow down revolutionary forces to their tempo. And there's no good outcome for the revolutionary forces to slow down to the Democrats' tempo. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, this is the reason why I've been pushing for, like, over a year for us to cover Boyd on General Intellect Unit. Uh, but uh, it'll, happen. it'll happen next year. Seriously, uh, we will we will do it. Uh, but um, yeah, yeah, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about like, uh, you know, communism is the real movement of the proletariat, um, which I think is more useful than like, Leninist formulations of what communism means uh, in a stagist format. Uh, it, it, you know, it's it's important to think about. Okay, so we have the real movement of the proletariat because we're talking in the, about like we're talking about the metaphor of movement. We can also talk about the metaphor of like tempo, right? Like te if 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 communism is the real movement of the proletariat, the tempo of that movement is actually very important. Um, so, you know, that like I really saw that with the George Floyd uprising, right, is like as Jeremy is saying, it got slowed down. Uh, it's not that the movement wasn't there. Right. It's it's that it, it got slowed down effectively. And that really stopped his power because as like, you know, you're kind of describing, right. There's that whole thing from like Schwinza that you should be unfathomable, right. From the art of war. But I think the, the useful thing there is like, that's connected to your tempo. And once the tempo of the movement slowed down, it stopped being covered on the news because it was a known quantity, Right. It wasn't unfathomable but anymore. It wasn't even worth talking about uh, is, is kind of how it seemed to go. So, I mean, this stuff is, is really worth thinking about in, in all these ways. Uh, Bose, go ahead, and then we'll go back to Shane. There we go. Um, just like the one thing that I wanted to tease out with relation to this discussion about like agility is uh, the phrase where he talks about how it's essential to the scientist to have as large an armory of weapons as he can amass in advance. And of course, like literal weapons would be good, but talking about just any you know knowledge base or institution to have before you start moving fast. And I don't necessarily think that the agility and the acquisition of these resources are necessarily in contradiction. Um, I think that it's just requiring us to be smarter about how we utilize that information or those resources. Um, it goes back to like what Shane mentioned about the surgeon and how, you know, even if far away from an operating room, he still has this experience so that he can react quickly in a triage situation. Um, and very similarly, I wouldn't want us to think that if we throw the first punch, we can, you know, in the time it takes to land, figure out what this boxing thing is all about. Um, so I think that, you know, the relationship between like how we can understand speed and that first actor, uh, mentality while not also becoming unfathomable to ourselves in the process. Like you want to stay unfathomable to the enemy, but you need those institutions and that experience, then especially that institutional experience 
to understand what you're doing and be able to have something to fall back on and maintain that agility and maybe even pivot after, you know, you become a little bit more narratively bound. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, there is definitely like a need for capacity development. Uh, and I think, you know, even beer would recognize that there are like different processes ha ha happening at different rates. Uh, we kind of saw that in his descriptions of what was happening in Chile. It's like some things are slower, some things are faster. It's like after I set up CyberSyn, I didn't need to work there anymore because that was a slower process. Um, that kind of thing. Uh, Shane, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with both there. And I think like the the... The, the eventual speed comes from an accumulation of practice. Like for the surgeon, like sur a surgeon initially goes slow, but by the time they're an expert, they go at extreme speed and like a, I don't know, like a death metal drummer or something. You, you can't play at 300 beats per minute consistently when you're starting out. Like you get there through practice and accumulation, accumulation of tools and weapons, accumulation of institutional experience. So it's, it's, it's uh, I think this is quite, this is a different take from like the kind of, anarchist insurrectionary sort of thing of just ah, just unleash the speed of the lump and immediately and ah, it'll all work out it's like no 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 it won't right you do need to build up structure but the point of building up the structure is not to accumulate inertia you, you're, you're not you're, you don't want to ac accumulate a cocoon of concrete walls around yourself you want to accumulate velocity and so you you go you go fast you go very fucking fast but ev but eventually and to get that fast you have to be well practiced um now, the, the other thing I want to say, like, to, to tie this back to the digestion metaphor, is that, like, how does a spider digest a fly? It starts by slowing it down. Yeah. That's the first move, is to slow it to a stop and then start digesting it. How does a slug or whatever digest its, its food? It coats it in slime and starts to break it down with acid. You slow, them, you slow the enemy down. It seems to be this, like, tempo stuff the the, the 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 combat of tempos does seem to be very fundamental and it really does seem that the entity that gets to call the pace of the engagement generally tends to win yes uh indeed uh so um yeah i think i i lost my train of thought there something about the first thing you said <laughs> to respond to but. So i was saying like um in contrast with like a uh, anarchist insurrectionary stuff of just like immediate speed we're talking about building right institutions that build yeah, speed yeah, yeah 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 inertia which is which is what you get with like you know bolshevization and shit like that it's like you you build inertia in the institution and build incapacity but what we need to do is instead build capacity and build speed Right. So I was thinking about the um, oral history of Kickstarter United uh, <clears throat> that I've been listening to uh, in preparation for our interview tomorrow. And uh, uh, one thing they talk about is there's basically two phases to their unionization process. The first one is where the enemy the bosses are not aware of their existence and they're moving at actually quite a slow tempo because they have this like freedom of maneuver. Right. And like, they're just building relationships with one another, building a framework for discussion, conceptualizing what it is the union should be. Uh, and all of that stuff is slow but ends up being useful as soon as the bosses find out they exist and they're thrown into crisis. After that, they have to move fast because, uh, yeah, they're they're thrown on the back foot because it's like, oh, OK, the bosses are on the attack now. We've got to move. We've got to organize. We've got to go into combat mode. Uh, but there is a prior phase that is essential to actually winning that fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the structure builds for speed right like yeah it's you, the, the structure that you build initially is what enables the agility later um yeah so we, we shouldn't think of it as being like oh a lack of structure like i think the the, the insurrectionary thing kind of almost leans on an assumption that the lack of structure enables speed and i don't think that's the case at all mm -hmm. i think a lack of structure mean, means that you're going to be caught in the web you will be the fly um, right Whereas uh, if you structure, like literally the fucking spider structures the world around itself so as to di dictate the pace of the engagement, it builds a web. Yes. You know? 
that building is essential for calling the pace of the engagement later. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, yeah but, uh, with the Kickstarter group, um, uh, uh, yeah, rem- reminds me of um, something that someone used to um, explain the OODA loop that, um, you know, um, supposedly like uh, the Viet Cong would used to go home to uh, get the rice harvest, and then the Americans or the French would think, that, oh, we won. <laughs> and then you know, like let, let, like start you know uh, start reducing patrols and stuff. And uh, uh, but then I mean, it, the, the fact that they were on a different time scale meant that th- that was also a for. It, but just the fact that it was on a slower one just uh, still meant that they were outside the other person's loop because like uh, they weren't capable of uh, um, you know recognizing a pattern that wasn't you know within like yeah you know, the, the, the 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 U.S. Army is optimized for World War II, and uh, if something's not like on that scale, you know either either way faster or way slower. Then, but you know, still coherent. Then you know, you're, you're still like a, a, you know, you're you you're in you're in their loop. You know, you are turning them from um, an, an opponent that's making moves to a problem to be solved. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Right, and that's kind of the key to guerrilla warfare, right? Um, uh, cool. Okay. Well, let, let's move on. Uh, all right, so uh, we'll move on now to the cybernetics of crisis. If cybernetics is the science of effective organization, then this science ought to be used in designing the organizational modes that are appropriate to a rapidly changing society and its rapidly changing institutions, of which the firm was initially taken as the example for this book. In the last four chapters, the model of the viable system has been applied at many levels of organizational scope, even to the state itself. Those contending, and some do contend, that it must be illegitimate to deploy the same structural model and the same informational criteria in such diverse ways have not accepted or possibly have not understood that this whole cybernetic theory of the viable system is based on the recursion theorem that demonstrates a particular set of structural invariances in all such systems. Even at the cytological level, for example, it is perfectly convenient to discuss what is going on in the single cell in terms of the language and logic developed here. The metasystem is contained in the nucleus, which houses the five, excuse me, which houses the system five policy stuff called DNA, including the system four systems of reduplication and adaptation and the system three plan for working the cells, or excuse me, for working the cell. Continuous direction, system three, seems to be shared with the mitochondria in their respiratory activity, which also has a major anti-oscillary system two regulatory role in arranging for the use of oxygen. The cilia are the limbs, system one, of the cell, which also detects sense data about their environment. There is, however, a different critical contention. It says that regardless of the correctness or otherwise of the cybernetic theory that has been advanced to account for viability, it is ridiculous to suppose that it can be used to bring about societary change. The reason given for this contention is that the attempt would be, and allegedly in Chile was, politically naive. This word, which labels an approach as simple or artless, has pleasing overtones when it is applied to childlike things. There is no doubt, however, that use of the word in the political context is so pejorative as to be intentionally damning. That is because artless means not lacking in artificial contrivance, but lacking in fundamental insight, necessary skill, and relevant experience. If this is the proper denotation of the term, then I shall go on to argue that all political acts are naive, and that therefore the attribution of political naivete tells us nothing except that the commentator manages only to be dismissive in just that context where he most needs intellectual act excuse me where he most needs intellectual acuity 
Because the character of this part of the book is founded in personal narrative, I approach the abstract cybernetic argument which will follow with just a few recollections of events which impinged on my own life by their political naivety as defined. It is done in the hope that the reader will be encouraged to pause and review his or her own experience. If it is parallel, then the cybernetic statements will be more readily understood. The first instance occurred when I was a boy in 1936. Midway between proclamation and coronation, King Edward VIII abdicated. This was a very startling event for almost the whole of Great Britain, and especially so for a boy being born along on the general heir of gelility. Essentially, though, the connivance of press barons, the government excuse me, <clears throat> essentially through the connivance of press barons, the government managed to keep secret a constitutional crisis of the first magnitude until it was almost concluded, and possibly not in a way, there is no means of knowing, that would have been decided by any remotely democratic process. If I was amazed by the event, I was even more amazed by the strong disagreements which the outcome disclosed, even within my own family, among my schoolmasters and schoolmates, and in the press. It was not to be for many more years that the facts known today fully emerged, and it has to be realized that, as with any historical event, there are broadly relevant facts which are lost forever. But 25 to 30 years, excuse me, 25 to 50 years on, people, and especially those who were not alive at the time, are content to believe that they now have the matter in perspective. Let us take a leap of 10 years. In 1946, I was a young officer in India at the time when the ultimately crucial decisions were being taken about the future of that whole subcontinent. I was naive enough, if that is the word we are discussing, to be amazed at the picture of the situation that was being purveyed in Britain. First of all, it was quite difficult to, to excuse me, first of all, it was quite difficult to, con to discover what this was. Letters from home, army instructions, and the responsible Indian press, informed by capitals other than London, told very different stories. This could not have been due simply to connivance by press barons on this occasion, but it was due to something. That much was clear. I did not then know that the atomic holocaust, which had curtailed my own preparation for an assault upon Japan, had been approved by Prime Minister Attlee without, as he subsequently declared, his having the faintest idea that what was being perpetrated was anything more than a much bigger bang. Next year, in March 1947, I must have been one of the very last Britons in India ever to propose the mess toast to the King Emperor. And so we left the partitioned India to its massacres and a legacy of subsequent further divisions, slaughtering, and even formal wars. But of course, all that too is in perspective now. The passage of another decade takes us to 1956, a date indelibly stamped on the face of Europe by the events in Hungary. So this is the Hungarian uprising. Uh, for myself, however, I was working in the British steel industry and had already made the original applications of cybernetic theory that eventuated in brain of the firm. But I had not yet been notified of any release from the first line military reserve. At this point came the crisis over the Suez Canal, which had been nationalized by President Nasser of Egypt. Once again, it was completely impossible to determine the truth of what was happening. Stories leaked out to the effect that Britain, France, and Israel were acting in, in collusion, but there were strenuous government denials at the time of this now-acknowledged fact. As before, the nation was seriously split on non-party lines, and the entire world appeared to be condemning the incipient British action against Egypt. While the forces were gathering, there were several announcements that the military reserve might well be called upon, and therefore I had to consider in advance what stand should be taken if my name were selected for this task. 
Now that some quarter of a century later, this incident also is seen in perspective, maybe I should be forgiven for a conscientious objection had it come to that. But for the ops, excuse me, but for the absolution to be real at the time, one would have to be seen to have been right. This is never on the cards until much later. It was the absence of fact rather than the absence of ethic that was dividing the country, although the facts seem to have been known to everyone else in the world as they happened. I mentioned at the outset that I would give utterance to these three incidents in the hope of creating resonant recollections in the reader. No further examples are offered, partly because they have proliferated dramatically as the world has grown smaller, thanks to its deployment of technology, and partly as more recent dates are approached, there is less likely to be consensus about what really happened. In any case, it is not the current purpose to make an historical analysis of these three moments of history. Whole books have already been written about each of them. The purpose is instead to show how our cybernetic vocabulary may be applied to the examination of political systems in the epoch of their developing crisis, and to demonstrate how conclusions may be drawn from thinking in these terms, which it would be virtually impossible to gainsay on scientific grounds. That is to say, the case is argued from first principles, those of variety engineering, and the examples are used only to show what is really meant in practical terms by the cybernetic nomenclature. There are many parties to a crisis, wherever it appears in today's world, and national boundaries are not absolute barriers to many kinds of intervention. In figure 48, three major interest groups, A, B, and C, are depicted as intersecting, in the hatch circle, in an imbroglio of developing crisis. We consider first the behavior of one of the three in cybernetic terms. Uh, so we have like a Venn diagram kind of thing uh, going on uh, with A, B, and C as these kind of amoeboid shapes. Uh, and we're interested in A, which is connected to a circuit. Uh, it goes from the core uh, to uh, sensory input, uh, which connects to a sensory plate. There's an anastomotic reticulum. Uh, the criterion of stability is developed in the anastomotic reticulum, which connects to a motor plate and then motor output, which goes back into the situation. Um, <clears throat> so party A, whose span of interest is depicted in the diagram by an amoeboid's phase space, has first of all to transduce the variety implicit in the crisis into the realm of its own capacity to act on the situation. That is to say, with reference to figure six in chapter two, that the sensory input information about the crisis uh, to be admitted to the sensorium in the decision-making brain of party A ought to balance and to preserve the variety capable of being generated by the crisis. The same is true of the motor input, the implementation of decision, and its projected impact on the crisis zone. True also then of the anastomotic reticulum connecting the sensory and motor plates, see figure seven and the discussion thereon, uh, and discussion thereon. In a, a well-regulated system, there are four major cybernetic requirements of such stability, which will be discussed in turn. Uh, so figure six and figure seven go all the way back to chapter two. Figure six uh, is kind of, uh, sorry, someone's, uh, so figure six uh, is about the relationship of a system to its environment uh, and the way that uh, the sensorium acts to regulate that. The figure seven is what shows the role of the um, anastomotic reticulum in connecting the sensory plate where there's these afferent impulses that come in to the motor plate where there's efferent impulses. So basically 
stimulus to action. Uh, that's, that's all that's going on there. Um, all right, so the first one, the first point, um, well, I guess we should talk about the previous stuff before going into that, because this is very, 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 very long, uh, the, the four points. Uh, so let's go to Mark and then to Jake. All right. Am I coming through? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, this is about as far as I got rereading last night because I saw how deep this was going to go. But uh, the, those historical examples, um, yeah, it's interesting because obviously they're not in any of our um, – uh, living memory, <laughs> but uh, uh, like I've been reading uh, for the last decade or so, I was reading uh, Kynaston's uh, like giant books on Britain from the Atlee to the uh, Thatcher governments, although he's only he only made it to the early 60s. And the whole Suez crisis is pretty interesting. Some of the stuff he touches on there, it's like, well, we know what was going on, but the rest of the world knew that, uh, you know, that we were doing a deal with Israel and France and <laughs> trying to screw Nasser. So, and that also kind of reminds me of like uh, Fletcher Prouty writing about the CIA. It's like, well, people in the USA don't know what's going on, but if there's a giant army base and, you know, being prepared for an amphibious landing in your country, people in that country sure as hell know what's going on and who's doing it. So uh, it, it's interesting because he like, he goes into depth and then like, you know, like talking about what happened with Edward is like, and mentioning democratic institutions. It's like, that it's, it's, it's a freaking monarchy, man. <laughs> what are you talking about? But uh, I, I just found those kind of elliptical, but it's like, it shows like, well, when you're in it, you don't, know what's going on but then he's like well this is i'm just illustrating cybernetics here but he seems to be pointing to like you know the confusion of the actual participants besides those that the that have the highest level understanding of what's going on right exactly and you know this is a really interesting point uh i mean it's maybe a, a somewhat obvious point but if you look so, uh, you know, last year I was teaching ethics, right? And a lot of the ethical literature assumes a greater degree of information and knowledge than people actually have. So, you know, maybe in inter interpersonal context, that kind of makes sense. Uh, that's what a lot of ethics deals with but when we're talking about the ethical relationship of the individual to collectivities information availability is often far less than perfect and ethical theories tend to not really take that into account very much like you could argue it's like well we don't want to talk about that because we want to talk about ideal cases where we can hash out like fundamentally what is the right thing. The kind of like uh, the idea that Beer talks about here about it, it's uh, being all in perspective, right? Having that 2020 hindsight. Um, but actually, if you want to talk about applied ethics or ethics that are useful in the world, you kind of need to take into account the uh, very imperfect information that people are working with. But even I don't know, even suggesting that there is such a thing as perfect information kind of gets away from the point about perspective that Beer is is bringing up here. Uh, but you know, like yeah, we 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 act from a perspective, and that perspective is often very limited. And it seems like you know practical ethics should actually take that into account uh, because what you're sort of saying is like, if you want to be an effective actor in these situations, you have to accept that you're going to be acting on less than uh, a total understanding of the situation. Uh, okay, so let's go to uh, Jake uh, and then Boast and then Matt. Yeah, I think uh, it's pretty like, I mean, it is one of those like obvious things when you say it, but like to say it maybe isn't 
as obvious, you know. Um, I think, yeah, his whole point about, I mean, this is something that he talks about. He's talked about in this book, he talks about in um, Heart of Enterprise, you know, a system is defined by the observer. You know, you can define systems in all sorts of different ways, depending on the information you have available. And I think also like being in a situation as like part of someone who's like experiencing it from like a particular perspective, you know, it's like, it's not that you're like, you're, you're biased because you've got these preconceived notions, especially, especially if you're talking about like from, you know, the perspective of someone who's like super like involved in like, you know, in whatever system is currently being like completely subverted or destroyed. Like you've got, well, this is thing, this is how, you know, things I've been told how things are. It's like, I've been told the CIA is good. So like, I can't to think that it could be just destabilizing these countries is ridiculous to me. But like, if you were in one of these countries that's being destabilized, you're like, yeah, of course they do. Cause like every time, like everyone that we know is fucking up things is like funded by the CIA, you know? So it's like one of those things where it's like being in the middle of it makes it tough to sort of see outside of it. Um, and, you know, I think, um, you know, but, but like all systems are operating from incomplete information, you know, it's like, it's, it's like one of those things that is just a complete like, blow to the core of like libertarian like philosophy of just like free market you know or free market philosophy of like well they, these are perfectly rational actors so you know the decisions they make are perfectly rational but it's like no no one has no one has complete information and it's like dumb to think that people are going to act as if they did because they don't and they can't um and yeah i'm definitely like i think this <laughs> this chapter i mean we've already talked about this but the chapter is going to be really important i definitely think we should like figure out how best to break it up you know i don't know if we can just go by like each point and then talk about the whole thing at once because maybe there's a lot there but um yeah i think uh you know yeah and then the way that you act on a perfect on a, on a given situation is like depends on how you are like on the information that you have um and you know his whole thing of the VSM is like getting the right information to the right people. And, and that doesn't mean all the information to the right people. It means like the subset of information that is like most relevant to them and most useful to their decision-making process. Um, so I'm definitely like curious to, I haven't finished this chapter cause I knew we were going to take forever to go through it. So I wasn't like too concerned with finishing it before this, but um, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's very interesting to see how, you know, how he talks about it in a crisis, because especially like we're in a crisis now, you know, the world is in crisis. And I think climate change is a really good example of that crisis thinking that is it's so all encompassing that it it's difficult for some people to even realize they're thinking within it, you know, and it like really is. Uh, I don't know, it's like at once pushing some people towards like missing the forest for the trees, you know, um, but then also uh, missing the fact that like some people want to destroy the trees, you know, or whatever. I, I don't know. Again, I'm mis I'm mixing metaphors here, but um, but yeah, I I think um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll stop there. Uh, so um, I do think what he says about sort of public information and its relationship to ethics is also interesting in the sense that um. He's kind of suggesting that a public that is subject to psyops of the sort that he's describing, right? Like where whatever the the monarchy and the press barons are hiding information or the British government and the press barons are hiding information uh, or, you know, the soldiers are not told about the actual situation they're in in India and what's going on. Uh, it... It, it means that they're not only sort of like practically inhibited because they don't have the information to act on, but they're also actually kind of like ethically inhibited. Like they can't actually do the right thing because they can't even begin to conceive of what the right thing would be. Right. Uh, so, you know, I feel like this is really core to like. Uh, like Herman and Chomsky's, like, you know, manufacturing dissent model, right? That this idea that kind of like, yeah, a public that is not actually 
appraised of the situation in a clearer way is fundamentally like ethically inhibited uh and and is is incapable of doing the right thing um so that that's an interesting point uh boast go ahead yeah i just wanted to touch on the the specifics of like the political uh naivete that he was talking about and just to kind of like underscore the fact that at least in my experience like this is always something that i feel falls hardest on whoever's making the charge and whoever it's being made against because it seems to be synonymous with saying i have an investment in the situation that we're in right now and i despise the idea that you would think of any alternative um especially just i wanted to speak because it, it came up last night during another um kind of book club meeting that i was in where we were talking about intergenerational conflict and the you know pretty consistent uh you know outcome where one generation just blames the next of being naive um especially when it comes to millennials being naive about politics even though at this point they're like you know in their late 20s early 30s buying houses being political actors for the last 10 years so it's almost more of a charge that's made out of wish fulfillment than one of actually assessing someone's knowledge of the situation yeah it's it's very pejorative and uh yeah it is just a an endless constant refrain throughout human history that the younger generation is naive. They don't have the wisdom of the older one. Uh, no doubt we will all make the same charge against younger generations. Uh, I mean, I don't know if we all will, uh, you know, someone like, someone like beer didn't seem to be in on that or in favor of that idea, even though he was like an old dude, but it's, there's, there's a, a sort of, uh, built in bias towards doing that. Um, and it, it, it's funny because you see young people posture in that way and it's like, haha, that's cool. And then you see them get older and do exactly the same behavior. And it suddenly becomes just like, okay, boomer uh, situation. Uh, but you know, that, that was my observance like recently is that this, this, uh, the younger generation naive thing is like, Oh, like, you know, millennials like inculcate that into their brain about their own generation. And then like accuse each other of that as like a ha ha I'm being ironic thing. But then once they actually like become boomer age, they're just doing the same thing, but it's no longer cool or ironic. It's just, okay boomer uh so yeah that's it's very uh it's a very long process of reaching that sort of ossified mind mind uh mindset and using these uh, pejoratives against uh, younger people uh matt go ahead Yeah, uh, it's one, 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 one to uh, I, I touch on more the the, the thing of like uh, um you know how um you know I guess say like a uh, uh, yeah a, a major dividing line between you know like people who think in terms of equilibria and stuff versus you know a complex systems or cybernetics or um I think maybe even you know like could even go back to Hegel insofar as I understand Hegel I, like that's kind of yeah you know, it, it's it's less about linear and just you know. Um, uh, uh, you know, assume, you know, you, you, it's safe to assume that you're already in equilibrium and has actual time lags. And, you know, like, like those time lags, like, make all the difference in the world. Because, um, uh, uh, you know, you often have multiple countervailing tendencies and, uh, uh, you know, th that, uh, uh, you know, w that uh, are leading to mutually exclusive um, uh, um, outcomes or, you know, combined to create, like, new weird outcomes. And just so much of the action is there, you know. Uh, uh, I was thinking, thinking back to, like, like a biochem cl class and just, like, you know, it, it really is, um, uh, you know, you, you have a bunch of stuff in one place and there's a bunch of different reactions that could take place. Like, it really is about which catalysts that favor, you know, different kinds of reactions that, you know, um, uh, 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 determines like what actually happens because like a lot of these reactions like without a catalyst it'll you know it'll you'll get like a milligram per hundred years even though it is still energetically favorable but you know um uh, uh you know with a catalyst you know you can get um uh, uh i don't know an, 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 an ounce in an hour like it's you know and uh, yeah i feel like society you know works kind of similar ways so, like the action really is in the in the in the in those little things and that's part of why that's part of why economics is pseudoscience like uh, sorry, could you just expand on what you're you're trying to say about uh, Hegel there? 
Um, yeah, I, I don't understand like Hegel that 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 well, but my, my understanding is that like the uh, yeah, there's a connection to like complex systems thinking, and that you know there, there's a yeah, you know, it's kind of a difference between um, yeah, being able to say yeah, being able to like there's a closed form analytic solution to something that says oh, okay, you know, I just have to solve this one equation to see like where the bullet will be after five minutes, versus like um, uh, um something that's more like simulation where you actually do have to calculate every intermediate step because it can go in a weird direction. My understanding is that that iterative approach, you know, kind of rhymes with something in Hegel in some way or another. Yeah, I can kind of see that in terms of like uh, that um, that point, like, you know, Hegel's point about hindsight, right? That, that really truth is in hindsight. Uh, it, it's um it's actually this like uh, combination of, of many factors that uh, results in a conclusion and uh, your conclusion is going to encompass all of those factors that went into the event. Uh, while the event is taking place, uh, I mean, Hegel would say it's impossible to know what's going to happen, but I guess complex systems theory may be a little bit more optimistic about our ability to no have knowledge about about the future but not that much more optimistic right like there's there's that that sort of fundamental unknowability we're working with uh so yeah i, I do think that you know what beer's describing here is pretty much in line like when he talks about things being in hand he's very much you know sort of echoing hegel's comment about Minerva's owl taking flight at dusk, right? It's, oh, it's in hand now. So, like, now we understand it, but that's not really the relevant window for action. Uh, Sheen, go ahead. Yeah, I just, um, I, I was kind of thinking of, like, something from earlier in the chapter, right, where... You know, there's like what we've just talked about here is all the, the nature of crisis and the way these um, information circuits are tied up in the, the evolving crisis. And these multiple agents have multiple different perspectives on it and nobody really understands what's going on. But then earlier in the chapter, he's even saying that like so, some some people or some institutions don't even recognize that this would be a problem. Like they, they, they don't even realize that this is the nature of crisis. It's kind of like gets you to that like West Wing lib sort of model of the world where like, oh, all these quarreling parties, they're actually all re really in agreement. They just need to realize that we just need to sit them down around the table and, you know, hash out the details. And then everyone will realize there was no conflict there all along. Or, um, or that sort of thing, or, or even like, you know, the, the belief that, oh, society is actually stable. It's just these, it's just these, 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 uh, these, these radicals are, are, are upsetting the balance, right? Like, they're, you know, that if we'd all stop rocking the boat, we'd, we'd all realize it was already stable all along. And I think that's, those are the people that Beer's talking about initially of the chapter of like the, the category of people who simply don't even fucking get it at the most basic level. They're not even at the they're not even not even at step one of being prepared to even think about the beginning of the problem um because their their view of the world is so fucking distorted from the beginning yeah and i mean arguably like at least from my perspective beer is kind of in that space too right where he's like if we had better organizational means the horrific state of the world would resolve itself because the problem isn't some kind of fundamental conflict. It's mm, yeah. that things aren't arranged properly. So, like, the, the confusion that originates out of bad organization is really the source of all these evils of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, given our, you know, enormous technological capacities, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we should be able to overcome these things. And he, he honestly does want to sort of believe the best of people, right? Like think mm -hmm. the best of people, give them the benefit of the doubt uh, is, 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 is uh, very much the perspective I get from the beginning of this chapter. Uh and it, mm -hmm. it, it's like, well, I guess, you know, 
from some perspective, like everybody could could agree with that, right? That like, you know, if this fundamental organizational issue of the world was resolved, then everything would be great. Like, I guess everyone on some level agrees with that. Like, you know, for a communist, it's like, well, if capitalism were gone and the value form was abolished and class exploitation didn't exist anymore, then people could get along a lot better. Right. It's it's just a different problem that we're pointing to than mm -hmm. what beer is pointing to is kind of like irrational organization. Uh, and, you know, in some ways, I guess that puts beer a little bit more in line with like Hegel in terms mm -hmm. of like, yeah, you need a rational world. But I guess ultimately we're all kind of gesturing to the same sort of idea. It's just where we put the emphasis. Mm hmm. Do you think maybe Beard doesn't drink his own Kool-Aid quite enough, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think so. Like, in the sense that his emphasis is so much on organization and not on material interests. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, there's the, like there might not be a material conflict there in the first place anyway. It might just yeah. be a matter of, of um, irreconcilable, or like not irreconcilable perspectives, but perspectives that are not reconciled. Right. And like, you know, I guess like for your for a communist is kind of like, well, yeah, if class didn't exist, then we would all have common material interests mm -hmm. so that you can kind of see it in the same way. But I think that beer sort of doesn't accept the reality of class consciousness mm -hmm. like he kind of does and doesn't at the same time right because he's like really interested in all this kind of like science for the people like people project stuff trying to like build up consciousness develop all these kinds of like you know radically reorganized things uh but generally speaking he just kind of like elides that problem like oh maybe you know, maybe like the, the the decision to do a coup in Chile and murder all these people was not good intentioned. <laughs> like maybe it wasn't just because the the CIA couldn't get their shit together. It was because they did get their shit together and they actually had really malicious intentions about what they were doing. Like it's. That seems to be like a reasonable read of the situation, but Beer doesn't really want to go there. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, yeah, the, the, the sort of uh, difference between malice. It's like Beer doesn't believe malice exists. He believes every yeah. instance of malice is an instance of stupidity. He's a sweet summer child, you know, it's it's endearing. Yeah, it's that, yeah. that kind of like... Uh... You know, like, like the, the, idea of, the, the idea of explaining malice by looking for stupidity is often a good idea, but I don't think it explains everything. <laughs> you, know? um, you look at like, uh, I don't know, just like a really clear example of malice, right, is like uh, Obama's like that, 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 that video of like Obama talking like in the in the like uh smoke filled room with a bunch of government operatives about uh conning people in Flint, Michigan uh about the the water situation there and then going and like being like you know give me a glass of water I'm going to have a drink out of it and then just taking like not even taking a sip of it but pretending he was taking one like that's an example of malice. He he understood exactly what the situation was and was deliberately trying to con people. That wasn't just because he was poorly organized. Uh, so, you know, I think this 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 kind of malice does exist in the world. It is a little bit, uh, dare I say, naive about it. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It is virtuous to recognize enmity as real, um, but beer beer doesn't really do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, I I don't think that's that's a blanket condemnation of his work. It's just 
mm, maybe we need to take a, into account the possibility that these conflicts are more fundamental than he's suggesting. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, uh, I think that does it for this uh, session. Next session, we will get into the first point uh, that Beer is bringing up here uh, and see how far we get. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see you next week for more of Chapter 20. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.